Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, we're here on uh, Corona Watch uh, with Mike DeWert. You may remember him. We did a show with him a few um, weeks ago, and um, um, we're gonna we're gonna update on that because he can give us the um, the charts and the graphs about the curves and the calculations. And very interesting show last time. This will be even more interesting because we have more experience. And Mike, incidentally, is our is our uh, corporate scientist. Our our chief scientist, if you will. It's very important for every organization to have one, and we have one, and Mike, thank you for doing that, Mike. But also, Mike is a uh, kind of Renaissance scientist. I don't mean he's stuck in the Renaissance. I mean, he's a scientist for, um, you know, for all matters, <laughs> a scientist for, for all seasons. So thank you for coming on again, Mike. Appreciate having you here. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me on. I'm glad to be here. So let's, uh, let's update. Uh, on how the curves are doing. Very important we know that yeah. uh, because this is, a, this is kaleidoscopically changing or could it's be. Amazing. Uh, so yeah. go ahead. Well, let's go to slide two to review what uh, pessimistic projections I showed before. Um, yeah. So on this slide, um, this is a prediction. The, uh, the top curve is. Hello? Yeah. Okay. The top curve, which is labeled world, um, was what I had predicted on February 26th. I had assumed that uh, China would have an effective lockdown and the rest of the world wouldn't. And that, that at that time, the doubling rate in the rest of the world is about every four days, the cases were doubling. And so the red dots were the you know cases up to March 25th. And um, turns out this uh, prediction held for another uh, few weeks after that. Um, I assume that the U.S. and Hawaii would have a similar rate of increase, which would have been pretty catastrophic. We would have been in a really catastrophic situation uh, starting now and then continuing through May. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's what's really happened so far. So, top curve is in the gray line is my world prediction from February 26th, and that held until about April 1st, and then the actions from the governments of the world, social distancing, contact tracing, quarantining, started to bend that curve over. Um, U.S. and Hawaii also started bending over about that time, and Hawaii um, now looks like it has like an almost a month doubling rate. U.S. is about 20 days. We have saved a lot of lives already. If you look at the world curve, there's about 8 million fewer cases today than there would have been if the world had taken no action at all. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. is a little over almost a million and a half fewer cases and if no action had been taken in Hawaii, a couple thousand. So as extreme as it is, you know, we've saved a lot of lives already. And we need to find a way, I think, to um, keep these curves slow, slow them down further uh, with, with less economic dislocation. Um, so, so yeah, right now here in Hawaii, we seem to be doing better than the U.S. mainland and even better than the world average. So to go to the next slide, let's see. This is uh, what the curve, when they say flattening the curve, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about trying to take that rate of increase that, that would peak at an incredibly high number eventually if the whole population uh, was vulnerable to the disease and, uh, and uh, slowing it down and making the peak lower than it would have been. Um, the real question is, have we really reached the first peak um, of, the, of the curve? Um, and if so, how low will the dip go before it re-accelerates? And uh, I'm pretty sure it will re-accelerate. We're nowhere near done with this yet. Um, so my guess is that if, if we can maintain this, we bought ourselves six months or so to prepare for the real peak. U.S. has bought itself about four months before the real peak, which is gonna happen in October. World, uh, you know, peak will happen in November. Um, this is pretty pessimistic still. And um, I'll have to see how the trends go. Like I say, this assumes that we all we have done is, is uh, switch over to a new exponential rate of increase that's slower, but still inexorably going to, going to snowball. Um, let's see, let's look at the next slide. Um, so if you really want to make sure you're flattening the curve and keeping it flat, you really just have to test. And the lower your, the lower, the rarer an infectious disease is, the more you have to test to make sure you can detect it. And you, and, and so if you're one in 10 people at risk 
were if, if you had one in, if, if one in ten people in the population say everybody that shows symptoms is at risk for having this uh, disease, you would only have to test about twenty to have a ninety percent chance of seeing that you have the disease in the population. If one in a hundred, you got to test over two hundred. It's one in a thousand. You got to test twenty three hundred people to have a ninety percent chance of uh, actually detecting the disease. Um, so you really have to test, 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 because one in a thousand is about where we are now in Hawaii, and you know we can't let it explode. Once it's once it's to one in a hundred, you're you're off to the races. So we have to test everyone that's been exposed, and, and this is nothing that. I came up with. This is what you know. Experts in the World Health Organization are saying, and what they've done in Korea, and Iceland, and Taiwan. Um, test everyone who's been exposed. Test anyone with even mild symptoms. You know, maybe it's the flu, maybe it's a cold, maybe it's a uh, COVID nineteen, and then trace contacts and get the contacts to self isolate. You know, you can be contagious for it's you know up to eleven days before you actually show symptoms. Um, it's still research in progress, but it's best to isolate people for two weeks if they've been exposed. Um, you can be contagious for two to three weeks um, while you've been sick and in the aftermath of, as you recover. So if we can get everybody at home to, to stay at home for a whole month, could we wipe out this SARS-CoV-2 virus? I don't know. But one thing we really, 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 really can't get complacent. In the 1918 pandemic in the United States, the second peaks were often the highest. Um, National Geographic has done a very, very good uh, uh, piece on this, on the 1918 pandemic. I know you've had the experts on the 1918 pandemic. I'm not an expert. Sure, I have Jenny Pressler or somebody else on. But uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see sort of what happened in 1918. Um, next slide. Yeah. So some cities didn't bother doing anything until it was way too late. Philadelphia, Philadelphia lost almost one percent of their population to the to the flu, and uh, SARS CoV uh, two is at least as deadly as the nineteen eighteen flu. U S overall lost about half of its pop, uh, a percent of its population. So in Hawaii today, that would be about five thousand extra deaths. We and, and to put that in context. Uh, last year in Hawaii, about 7,500, about 7,000 people died last year in Hawaii. Um, so we'd almost double our death rate for the year, not, and not even counting the knock-on effects from people not being able to get health care because of the overwhelmed health care system. Mm. Um, St. Louis had a, a higher second peak because they relaxed their social distancing. Um, this whole thing lasted all, you know, 24 weeks, almost six months uh, before they could declare it over. So we're, we're probably not even halfway through this pandemic yet for the, for the United States. Um, and I think I have one more slide. Um, what is that one? Uh, next slide. Yeah, oh yeah, here's just, just to bring it home. Yeah, San Francisco had a pretty good second peak. St. Louis, the second peak was even higher than its first peak. Um, it's just, you can't get complacent. You know, New York was very aggressive, they, like they are today, and they probably and they saved a lot of lives. They had a lower death rate than other cities on the East Coast. Um, so this, like I said, we just got to continue our social distancing. Um, and really, the one thing that would let us go back to work is uh, diligent testing and contact tracing. Um, that that is what we really 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 need and we're the united states is behind the curve on testing uh, i'm sure as you had your other experts on say so well i mean, I mean is, this is, oh. <laughs> what's the good news the good news is we slowed it down and slowed it down a lot uh we slowed it down these extreme measures I and mean, can we keep them up Should, are we going to be able to keep them up um or can we find another way I've I've come to the conclusion that talk about reopening the economy should happen after we we have made some real headway, and yeah. I think let me throw something at you. I think yes, I suppose we have have, have 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 kept the number of cases down by social distancing and containment, as in other countries. But at the end of the day you can do a much better job 
if you have testing, ubiquitous testing, um, and you know, I mean, and you have the bioinformatics to actually analyze that testing, and you you you, you connect that with the tracking, and now you yeah. know everybody who has it, and you can you know you can uh, focus the. Uh, the, the, the uh, quarantine, uh, for con the containment on the people who are really, uh, you know, uh, shedding the virus. Um, yeah. We haven't done that. We haven't done that. This has yeah. been a sort of a shotgun blast. And yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I'm happy that we have contained it, limited it to some extent. But my, my proposition to you is we could have done a much better job oh. at containing oh. it had we used uh, testing and tracking. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly what they found in South Korea, Taiwan, Iceland, Singapore, you know, testing and tracking and then get the people who have been exposed, um, you know, to to self isolate until they show that they're clear of the disease that they haven't actually contracted it. Like I said, it takes, you know, two to 11 days for this for you can be contagious before you're, you have symptoms. Um, and and, and it, it takes a lot of people to do this tracking of contacts you've got to interview the person who's sick and then you've got to get them to really tell you who they've been with and, and then you've got to go track those people down that's a lot of work and it can't be done via just a cell phone or ai app you know you, you, it takes people and that's one thing that we're not really doing a very good job of you know it might take something like i think i read one estimate that it would take at least three hundred thousand people in the united states to do this tracking actually be engaged in that work um, it's an investment worth making you know in other countries people who are out of work because of the uh, quarantines and the lockdowns are actually volunteering to do this and that's helping a lot um, so yeah you're right well you, we, we need to tap into people who are of goodwill and who are willing to volunteer some of them uh, are being paid to stay at home well maybe we could repurpose them and get them out. That, that issue came up in connection with the HGEA this week. Um, and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, I think I think we could generate, especially in Hawaii, uh, a, a powerful force of volunteers to do this. Because you don't necessarily have to expose yourself to do the tracking. You can do it on, you know, on the telephone. You can do it on Zoom. Um, you can do it without you know, necessarily meeting them. Uh, and even if you yeah. do meet them, you can you can use masks and distancing so to minimize the risk. So I hope that's coming soon. But let, let's talk about a, an ideal world. You know, right now, and I think it was in the morning in a civil beat that uh, there's there's a group of researchers here in Hawaii who are looking for money to develop a test. Um, it's, it's remarkable, is it not, uh, that here we're months into this thing, uh, we we know clearly as a matter of science and logic that we've got to be able to test if we're going to contain it. But we still don't yeah. have ubiquitous testing. Right. Next week, right. we're interviewing a researcher in uh, MSU, Michigan State University, uh, who hit the national press on a, on a, on a fast test that he made. Um, okay. and, and speed is, speed is everything. Right now, yeah. if you get tested here in Hawaii, a, it'll take you a week or 10 days to get the results. Yeah. That's much too long. That's because they have to send yeah. it back somewhere and all these protocols. Uh, that right. is really in, inadequate. So I mean, to me, testing is the first thing um, to, to, to reducing the curve in, in real time. Um, right. And I don't right. think we're there. Um, and yeah. the tracking thing, let me, let me point out on the tracking thing. We, uh, we did a show on this yesterday. It seems there's a, a joint venture kind of collaboration going on between Google and Apple to develop a tracking mm -hmm. app uh, such as right. the Chinese developed in Wuhan, uh, where you can tell um, you can tell that somebody who is tested positive is within your you know your Bluetooth range, and it will warn you about it. Um, right. uh, furthermore, you know it, tracking means bioinformatics. It means it means database processing and all that. So all this has to be coordinated. And regrettably, Mike, um, on the federal level. The, the White House has done, may I say, virtually nothing. I mean that in the <laughs> nicest possible way. To extend right, right. the tests, and to coordinate the tests, and to, right. and to allow systems, develop systems for tracking. So we are missing out on two very important tools, as far as I can see. Right. If we had those tools, we'd be much better off, right? 
Yeah, ProPublica just reported a couple of days ago that there's a lot of excess deaths from pneumonia and other illnesses in cities that aren't being recorded as you know SARS-CoV-2 related because um, they don't test the dead people, and that's that's silly. You've got to test the people who die of the disease too, because you need to trace their contacts. Um, even if you think that it just might be SARS-CoV-2, you've got to tr test people for it. Um, yeah, one way for countries to make their statistics look good is to not bother testing. Like North Korea is still sure. reporting zero cases. It's like, that's not credible. Um, yeah. And yet, yeah. transparency is everything. Yeah. 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 So, then you see uh, a, go ahead. Well, there's just so much bad information out there as well. You know, there was a report, Wired Magazine picked up a story of, from a South Korean. Uh, research group that put a paper into the annals of internal medicine that um, masks don't help. And um, I went and I looked at that paper and I looked at the data the researchers themselves published in that paper. And A, it was a really grossly underpowered study. There were only four patients. And what they had them do is they had them breathe on a Petri dish that was placed eight inches in front of their faces. And they did it without a mask, with a surgical mask, or with a two-layer cotton mask and they controlled by having them breathe before with them without a mask and then repeated the no mask test after all the other breathing and they said that the masks weren't effective in their conclusions but what the paper showed was that the uh surgical mask cut the red, cut the amount of virus on the petri dishes by factor of two and the two-layer cotton mask cut the amount of virus in the petri dishes by at least a factor of 10. Uh, at least a factor of 10. Factor 10 isn't good enough if you're a doctor or a nurse being exposed to these patients. It's really significant though, if you are going to the grocery store and you are just gonna do that once a week, um, if you can reduce your risk, or the risk of the people around you by a factor of 10, that's worth it. So a two layer cotton mask seems to be um, more effective than a surgical mask and definitely effective. And I wrote a comment in the Annals of Internal Medicine about that and a couple of other researchers wrote that you know, the same thing, that this, their data contradicts their conclusions. Uh, unfortunately, comments aren't publicly available you have to be, you have to be a member or you have to register to get to them. So, but anyway, so there's a lot of, they're about what's effective, what's not effective. Um, yeah. Quinine in, in uh, Brazil, uh, they were doing a study where they had high dose quinine treatment and low dose quinine treatment, the very sick people they had to stop the high dose arm of the study because more people were dying of heart damage from the quinine than they were saving from the, from the SARS COVID-2 virus. So, um, yeah. so well, I mean, the White House, the White House is, is um, and then not only the White House, but other health, um, health um, experts, quote experts, have, have really confused us on the masks. Oh, yeah. um, I think, I think it probably motivated because there weren't enough masks. Um, and they told right. us not to use it, but but you don't have to be a scientist to know that if you put something in, in, in between you and the virus, you're gonna be better off. Um, and yeah. and the, you know this this poppycock about how uh, only the people who have the disease should wear the masks. To me, that was yeah. poppycock with, at the inception, and they were telling us that in no no right. uncertain terms. You don't need a mask. They said, and I think you know, to to ask you about how that affects yeah. the curves. If we had all been wearing masks from the outset, yeah. even surgical masks, we would have had fewer deaths. Am I right? We would. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, like I say you just the mask is not that hard to wear. You just got to wear one, have one. We got to be available. Um, yeah. Hard thing. To you take it off in a way that you don't contaminate yourself um, so you got to wash your hands before and after you take it off and there's instructions online about how to doff your your, your protective gear properly um, yeah so yeah no we would have saved lives if people have been masking all along like a, yeah it, well, what I, what I'm re really amazed is that this these great United States uh, the guys who won World War II the guys who yeah. developed the Marshall Plan, the guys who created, you know, uh, B-24 bombers overnight, you know, one off the assembly line every X hours or days, uh, we can't make masks. We have to import masks. We have to import them from, from uh, Korea, just the way we're importing tests from Korea. 
It, it mm. strikes me as amazing. And then and the, the Defense Production Act has not actually been implemented to do that. So it's a sort of a voluntary basis and, and everybody goes to the, uh, the fabric store and buys fabric or they, or they go online and they find out how to turn a t-shirt inside out. That's ridiculous. The federal government has billions of dollars of resources. They have all these scientists, many of whom they fired or you know discouraged in oh, yeah. recent years. Um, and the, the result point. is we do not have masks. And uh, oh God, it's really awful to think about it or test. So my question, you know, is um, um, why why not? What happened? What went wrong here? Is this a federalism problem? Is this a problem of somebody sleeping at the? Got all these guys standing behind Trump who are medically, you know, Akamai, and they're telling us the wrong story about masks. Yeah, except Fauci, you know, he seems to be, Fauci seems to be trying to give us good information. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the South Koreans and the Taiwanese learned from the MERS problem that they have to be on it when it comes to these new infections. You know, the Taiwanese, when they heard rumor about an infection in Wuhan, they sent some of their scientists there to study it and they came back and said, by golly, we got to watch this thing. That's why Taiwan has an incredibly low infection rate, even though they're very close to China. They started screening everybody from Wuhan in January. Every flight that came in, you got screened. And uh, they then screen, test, contact, trace. You know, we in the United States, sort of the victims of our own success, we think we're so much smarter than everyone else in the world um, that we can't learn from them. And the Taiwanese kind of, you know, they had learned from their mistakes. They had the test capacity built. We won't import tests from other countries, even though like Germany has offered us extra testing kits. Um, even China has offered us extra testing kits. We're a little bit behaving a little bit arrogantly here. You know, we're yeah. not humble for help. Like, like you pointed out with the doctors, we're not humble enough to let Mexican doctors in to help us or Cuban doctors or Guatemalan doctors, you know, there's Latin America doesn't want it, this thing to spread to them and they would help us stop it here. Because right now the United States is the global center of the infection, par partly because of our arrogance. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I, I think the, the bottom line is if, when uh, Donald Trump gets up and takes credit or tries to take credit uh, for, for the reduction that you described on the chart, um, he's yeah. really not entitled because he could have he could have done so much more to reduce that curve, even to stop it at the outset, but he didn't do yeah. that. So yeah, now, now we're in a... okay. Yeah, no, I mean the governors have stepped up, uh, especially you know like Mario Cuomo, even our, our governor, Governor Ige, they stepped up to take action. They listened to their scientists that you know, this is what we got to do to stop it, since the rest of the country is doing anything to stop it. You know, like, yeah. The United States does, doesn't let us in Hawaii control our border. We can't shut down the port. We can't shut down the airport. We can't stop the flights. We can't stop the ships. So we have to resort to things like quarantining everybody that comes in for. T yeah. That's well, I want to talk about United one other States. one other feature of the charts that you were pointing Bullshit. to. I think yes. we have we have some very interesting points there about the reinfection about the, the second wave or more, yeah. the third, whatever it is, uh, a la what happened in 1918 and 19, when we, we sent our troops yeah. to Europe, yeah. um, the thing mutated and came back with a vengeance and reinfected us something awful. But right now we're in a very interesting spot. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, it doesn't have to mutate a, for the second wave. What happens, you just have to get complacent about your social distancing and uh, your quarantining measures, because um, yeah. we are nowhere—we are nowhere near herd immunity yet. I mean, we, maybe yeah. a few percent of the population has had this disease and is now immune. Um, we are nowhere near having achieved herd immunity, and there's no vaccine. So, all we have to do is relax our guard, let down our guard, and we're back on that doubling every four days curve. Um, well, I think which in is, some places in the country, in some places in the country, there will be complacency. There will be. Oh, <clears throat> oh, yeah. if, if there is a, they didn't do a good job on distancing to begin with. They were not Akamai, for example, about the, uh, uh, the New Orleans uh, uh, Mardi Gras, which, which cost many yeah. lives. And other places oh, yeah. where they continue to go to restaurants and bars, 
because the states yeah. didn't act fast enough and there was no federal order about anything, including masks. Right. And this president won't wear a mask. So he's discouraging right. people. He's telling them you can be complacent and it's no problem. But worse now, and this is what I wanted to ask you about. So I think complacence, complacency is, is a central point going forward. And the other point, the other point is is the notion um, that we are, if we if we attend to the economy without mm -hmm. fixing these primary problems like masks and testing and bioinformatics and analysis, if we if we ignore that, go complacent on that, which I think he's really messaging that we should do, um, and then right. sort of spend spend our time and effort and resource and, and and public and the oxygen in the room is all about the rebuilding the economy. I think yeah. we are building in complacency and we are building in a second wave. Am I right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. There will be a second wave. I mean, there will be, and the question is how big it will be and how bad will it be. Um, you know, if we don't get if if we can't delay the the peak until after a vaccine's available, um, there will be a second wave and it will be bad. Um, and we not, it's not clear to me that we're through the first wave yet. Um, we'll have to see a few more, you know, another week or so of data to see if we actually got through a first peak. And now we have bought ourselves time to really get sensible precautions in place. You know, I could say the contact tracing testing, and you're right, the testing has to be quick. It can't take weeks. It's got to be days and preferably hours to get a result back that's reliable. Unfortunately, the way the government's done it now, there's uh, it's a wild west in terms of testing. They've opened up the testing to all kinds of private companies that, and they've relaxed the rigorous standards required for a medical test. So where you can buy a test online and you don't really know how reliable it is. And that's just wrong. I mean, yeah, other countries in the world have solved this problem. You know, Taiwan, Korea, Germany, um, Italy, um, China, and yet we're 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 letting the capitalism hold sway even in this area. You know, we're letting people make a buck off tests that may not be reliable or may not be able to distinguish uh, this SARS-CoV-2 disease from this from a common cold coronavirus, and and that's what's scary. If you can't distinguish uh, this disease from the common cold you got a pretty useless test. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, um, uh, it's pretty scary to hear the possibility that the second wave would be worse than the first wave. Um, oh, yeah. I think if we're all complacent and we don't follow the rules and we haven't solved these threshold problems, it, it, it very well could be worse. And if it's yeah. worse, there will be many more deaths that are completely unnecessary, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yes, I agree. And uh, it's uh, the lesson in 1918 is, you know, we could lose half a percent of our population, which doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, that's that's double the death rate uh, for the year. Um, I mean, there'd be a lot of funerals um, from our complacency. And um, I, don't know if, I don't know if you've talked to Jenny Pressler or any other experts who, are, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one who's sounding the alarm, um, but yeah, we've, we've got to maintain, we. As you said, we got to test, we got to trace, we got to quarantine, and to make sure that we can do this in a way that's sensible and the least intrusive possible. They've had some success in Iceland with this. They still let gatherings up to 20 people happen um, because they have this testing that's fast. You know, <laughs> and they can test people, and they do test people. In South Korea, you don't need to have symptoms. You can just go ask to be tested, and they'll test you. Um, I mean, if you think you've been exposed, you can get tested. Um, yeah. yeah, and that, that's so these things are all out. coordinated. They're all they need to be coordinated. The okay. masks, Fine. maybe you don't need them so much if you have a lot of testing. Uh, if the tests are fast, maybe you don't need so many masks or test. So the whole thing is like an algorithm about how you're going to deal with this. Uh, with the, with right. the net effect, you have fewer cases. But you know, let me ask you. This is a, so personal. I mean, I, I'm I'm trying to avoid getting this disease mike and so are you oh yeah and for our respective families we're trying to avoid so we're going to take the reasonable if not reasonable even sometimes super reasonable 
precautions that are available to us. And that means not going out so much. It means wearing a mask. And if there were tests available, maybe we would you know, be more on it. I don't think tests are all that available here for somebody who just right. wonders about it rather than has serious symptoms. Right. <clears throat> so so I, I'm thinking that one of the factors in play is that there are a lot of people like you and me Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump could get, get up and say, don't worry about a thing. He said that before. Don't worry about right, a thing. Right. This is going to go away in some magical fashion. All we have to do right. is rebuild the economy. Let's get out there and open those businesses. Let's walk yep, the streets. Awesome. Let's have our gatherings. Go to church on Sunday. All that stuff. Don't mind it. Okay. And I'm not going to follow that. You're not going to follow that. And a lot of the people I know are not going to follow that. But what do you think the, the country in general will do? It's hard to say, you know, like in Michigan, you see people uh, trying to lock up, chanting lock her up at the governor because she wants to put in social distancing requirements and masking requirements. I mean, it's the things that we're doing here in Hawaii and Michigan, they're chanting lock her up to the governor. I mean, this country has such a polarization where a lot of people think that any of this illness, if they don't know somebody who's sick with it, it's just a conspiracy to take away our freedoms. Um, you even see that in Hawaii. You see some of that here. Um, it, it's a case where the freedom to not wear a mask and to gather in groups of thousands it, it constrains a bigger freedom, which is the right to life uh, and not dying of this disease. Um, it, it, yeah, I, and, and in terms of the precautions I take, yeah, I wear a mask when I'm at the grocery store. Um, I'm a caregiver for an Alzheimer's patient. Um, I have caregivers come in and help me a few days a week. They're the biggest risk we have because they're poor people who some of them ride the bus to get here and they mask, but their masks are just surgical masks. And I was actually astonished when I read about the one place that had been burglarized of a quarter million dollars worth of N95 masks. It's like, well, wait a minute. I don't, this place employs caregivers for dementia patients and other people who need help. And their caregivers are getting the N95 masks. They're getting the cheap surgical masks that are only 50% effective. Why aren't they getting the N95s? Why was there a warehouse full of N95s that weren't being used by people who are going out in the community and actually putting themselves and their patients at risk, you know, to do this work? Um, so we even see nonsensical things happening here in Hawaii. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know why they were hoarding the masks, but the company was hoarding the masks. I don't know why. Um, but here, we, um, we're a little more sensible than average. In the United States as a whole, you see some pockets of sensibility, California, Washington, Oregon, New York. Um, and then you see some pockets of craziness, uh, like, like the people in Michigan who are trying not to have to do any social distancing. And, um, we nearly need to try to get, it would help if we had cheap, quick testing so that you can be tested just to, if you want to be tested, get tested and viable, because then we would have to have fewer of these harsh restrictions. But that's what's key is getting the testing done and then really getting people to at least wear their masks in public um, mm. until we you know, get the vaccine. Um, but you know, people are going to resist. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, I'm rambling. No, I'm saying. If, well, if I, we we. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you, Mike. You're so you're so courteous. Um, let me let me just say that what, what I get out of this discussion with you, and uh, and the charts and the graphs and the considerations um, of the second wave and the complacency and all that. And all of the things we've discussed, the masks and the testing and the, and the, and the analysis of the testing, um, the tracking. Um, what I get is, is this, from a rational point of view, this absolutely needs um, a central authority, a central mm -hmm. repository of expertise coming up with well, well thought policies and implementing around this country. And, yeah. and the tremendous tragedy of this of yeah. this pandemic is that we don't have that. We have disinformation, yeah. misinformation. Yeah. We have zero zero effort 
even under existing law, we have a, a fragmentation from city to city and state to state. We do not have policies that apply everywhere. We have, I mean, it's, it's really a mess. And, and I think that it shows. Yeah, yeah, it shows. I mean, we, we had a pandemic uh, working group that was supposed to actually prepare for this after 2008, uh, the MERS thing. Um, because we knew we could be a hit with this. We knew that the United States, uh, even though it's isolated by two big oceans on the other side, was not immune in the age of jet travel. And that group was disbanded. And uh, all the warnings sort of ignored, you know, that, oh yeah, we're the United States of America. That, that kind of stuff only happens in those, you know, countries that are poor and backwards and, you know, not worth considering. And, um, that, that, like I say, that arrogance has just really come to bite us. And it's not everybody in the States is arrogant, but the people in charge of this were arrogant and uh, more more concerned with um, their stock portfolios, perhaps, than they were with the health and welfare of their fellow citizens. And uh, let's hope that's changing. Uh, there's people in the government definitely trying to change it, trying to do the right thing. There's people in the military trying to do the right thing. You know, you have an admiral or a captain of an aircraft carrier, you know, says, look, I've got a pandemic on my ship. And I have no way to social distance my sailors. We've got to do something about this. And uh, so he gets reprimanded and uh, the actual, I've never seen anything like this where the uh, uh, guy who's in charge of the Navy goes to, onto the ship and disparages the captain to the crew and calls him names and says he's stupid. And I'm like, you all, you, I don't know about it military necessarily, but in corporations, you know, there's a saying, praise in public, reprimand in private. Right. You know, right. You, you, you have to be pono with your people. You have to treat your people with respect and recognize they're trying to do the right thing. You know, so now, of course, that, that Navy secretary is gone now. Um, he realized that he did the wrong, th or somebody realized that they did the wrong thing, apparently. Uh, once you've gotten on the wrong side of Donald Trump, you're out. But now Fauci's on the wrong side of Donald Trump, and I'm really worried about them getting rid of Fauci because he's one of the few yeah. voices of reason in this matter. Um, yeah. So, well, I, you know, yeah. I think I think we've already seen tragedy here. We were in a yeah, tragedy. The economy is in a tragedy. It, a tragedy. It could have been avoided. But I think what I also get out of this is that in the second wave the tragedy is going to be that much worse. Um, and that and that could happen, am I right? It could happen just you know, between now and six months from now, the election. And the American people could find out the hard way that they've been misled or not led. Um, and, you know, hopefully that will be, re, uh, you know, expressed in their votes at, on election day, uh, assuming we can have an election day. Uh, what, what are your thoughts yeah. about that? I mean, this has got to have a political implication. Well, I got. I got to say, the way um, uh, our primaries in Hawaii have been. So we just had Democratic Party a presidential preference poll. It was all done by mail. When we, when the party, Democratic Party, decided to do it by mail, SARS-CoV-2 was not on the radar screen at all. It was just try to get more people to participate in the election. We thought this was a good way, um, and it turned out to be brilliant. I mean, we were able to hold. A, essentially a primary um, totally by mail and apparently Hawaii that's what we're going to have to do is hold our primaries by mail and then find a way to hold our elections by mail and the security is going to be really really difficult you know and I and I thought this before why for example when I get uh, I own stock in a few companies and I get and notices from meetings and I can go online and vote on the issues before the company's shareholders. And I can vote for the board of directors online. And there's a security code that's unique to each person. You put in your security code and you cast your vote. And here's billions of dollars are at stake sometimes in these companies holding these uh, online shareholder meetings. Well, why can't we do that with the US elections? Why can't we have a way of voting that's secure enough? If it's secure enough for Procter and Gamble and IBM and Microsoft, um, you, you would hope that we can make these things secure enough for our governments. That's going to be really hard because you need a U.S. wide standard. And so far, 
um, the election management has been left up to the states. And that might be written into the Constitution, so it might take quite an effort to change it or to get all the states to agree on a standard. But that's what we need yeah. is some way yeah. to go online by mail and have secure elections without people having to be face to face during a pandemic. Um, now, South Korea just did have an election. Their election was not all online. But what they did was they had po a lot of poll workers. They moved out to do the work at the polls. You had to sanitize your hands. You had to wear gloves. You had to mask up to go into the polling place. And then as you left the polling place, you took off the gloves, you threw them in the trash. Um, and that way, every they had the most, probably the safest you know, election they could have in the middle of a pandemic. But that's the kind of thing we have to do, but we have to be able to gear up for it. We have to have the people, we have to have the equipment, we yeah, have to have yeah, the will. Yeah, yeah. And we have to Marianne. learn from what others are inventing. Okay, we got to go. Yeah. Um, Mike, okay. great discussion okay. with you again. I hope we can circle back in a few weeks and check out how, okay. how your curves are doing then. Uh, Mike well, DeWert, our chief scientist with curves. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See you, Jay. Okay. See you. Aloha. Bye -bye.